predicting the type of radioactivity. So, some very good questions. Why are nuclides radioactive? What makes things radioactive? And why do they undergo different types of decay? I mean, we've looked at some examples, but why beta decay for this one and why alpha decay for this other one? Well, we have to think about what's going on inside the nucleus. So a nucleus is a collection of nucleons. Nucleon is a collective term for the protons and the neutrons because we got tired of saying protons and neutrons all the time, so we call them nucleons. Nucleons are held together by the strong force. That's a very creative <laughs> name, isn't it? I know, right? The strong force. There's strong force and weak force, it turns out. This is a fundamental force of physics that acts only on very short distances. So you guys who are in physics, what are the other forces? Excellent. Electromagnet electromagnetic force, gravity, and then there's strong force and weak force. So has it ever bothered you that the nucleus has a whole bunch of protons right next to each other and they have positive charges? Because don't positive charges repel each other? They do. They do. So we've got two opposing forces here. We've got the repulsive force of the electrostatic, the Coulombic force between protons, positive charges repel each other. This is still true in the nucleus. But then we also have this attractive strong force between all the nucleons. So neutrons are attracted to other neutrons. Protons are attracted to other protons. Protons and neutrons are attracted to each other. There's just all this attraction offset by the repulsion between protons. I tried to find a really cool video about the strong force, but I, I didn't find one in time. So the neutrons play a very important role in stabilizing the nucleus because the neutrons contribute only attractive force. They don't get involved in the repulsive force, whereas the protons have both. So you might think, well, let's just put a whole bunch more neutrons in there, and the more neutrons, the more stable it will be. Well, it turns out that the nucleons have energy levels also. We know that electrons have energy levels, right? And we went into all of that in Chem 1A, the 1S2 and 2S2 and all of that business. So we're not going to talk about what those energy levels are, but there are energy levels within the nucleus. So as you add particles, like if you're adding neutrons to a nucleus trying to increase its stability, as you add more neutrons, they're going into higher energy levels. And so there comes a point where the payback you get from the strong force gain is offset by the high energy level that that neutron has to be in, and so it doesn't help out anymore. So neutrons help to stabilize, but the really important thing um, is the ratio of neutrons to protons. So N for neutrons, Z for, that's the atomic number, number of protons. So this ratio is an important number in determining uh, nuclear stability. Lots of trains tonight. So they talk about the valley of stability. Um, I guess it's sometimes also called the island of stability, which, which I prefer, prefer because, I don't know, I don't really see a valley in there. Um, and the book doesn't clearly state this, but I'm pretty sure the yellow here is the, uh, we're graphing number of neutrons against number of protons. And the yellow would be all known nuclei. So all the different elements and all their different isotopes. The ones that are stable are in green. So that you see that the stable ones form a very distinct pattern along here. And this is what's called the valley of stability or the island of stability. So anything with these ratios of neutrons to protons is going to be stable. And if it's, if it's greater or less, it will not be stable. So we see that that ratio increases from 1 for the smaller elements up to about 1.5 
for the larger elements. And above an atomic number of 83, there are no stable nuclei. So once that nucleus gets that large, none of them are stable. And that's why all these man-made elements, you know, some people find great amusement and somehow get funding to create new elements, right? And they are so unstable that they don't even know what color they are because they can't make enough of them to actually get a, a color on them or even see what state they are at room temperature, right? Because they just fall apart into other things so quickly. And, and the, these are just estimates of, you know, based on number of no, neutrons and number of protons. So this predicts which things are going to be stable. It also helps us to predict um, what type of radioactivity will be exhibited by these different radioactive nuclides. So if it's below the valley of stability or above the valley of stability, it's going to have a different type of radiation. So if the ratio is too high, the ratio of neutrons to protons is too high, these have too many neutrons, and so they're going to undergo beta decay. Because beta decay converts neutrons to protons, and that lowers the ratio. The radiation, the radioactive emission, is an attempt to increase stability. So if the ratio is too high, it's going to undergo beta decay and bring that ratio down. Other nuclides have an n to z ratio that's too low. So you can think of them as having too many protons, or you could think of them as having not enough neutrons. And so these tend to undergo um, positron emission or electron capture, because that will um, convert protons into neutrons and make this ratio come up. Alpha decay also, where's my pointer? Alpha decay also raises that ratio, but the effect is much smaller. Any questions? So to predict the type of radioactivity, and this, of course, is not foolproof, but you can look at figure 19.5, the valley of stability, or you can compare the mass number of the nuclide that you're trying to predict to the atomic mass on the periodic table. The, the atomic mass of the periodic table is going to be um, the average of all the known um, isotopes. Sorry, I blanked out there for a minute. Um, because it's an average of the stable nuclides, it's going to reflect a ratio that's just about right. So how do you do that? An example is helpful. If we look at ruthenium-112, and we're trying to predict what kind of radioactive decay this might undergo. The atomic mass of ruthenium on the periodic table is 101. So ruthenium, where'd you go? 44? Thank you. Right smack dab in the middle, right under iron. Ruthenium is, has an atomic number of 44. So if it's 44 and the mass number is 112, but a more stable mass number would be 101, do we need more neutrons or fewer neutrons? We need fewer neutrons, right? So we need the form of decay that is going to reduce the number of neutrons, and that's going to be beta decay. Yeah. So predict whether each nuclide is more likely to decay via beta decay or positron, positron emission. So to just help ourselves out, beta decay is, has what symbol? Beta. No, the nuclear symbol for the particle. It's an electron, right? And positron emission, 0 and plus 1. So lead 192, we find lead on the periodic table, and a stable atomic number is 207. Right. So its atomic mass is 207.2. 
So the yeah, my brain just turned off. Did a little reboot there. Okay, so 192 is trying to become 207. Is this a high ratio or a low ratio? Because it, it's it can be hard to think about this. So lead has 82 neutrons. Protons. I'm sorry, protons. <laughs> It's not really hard to think about. It's hard to talk about. 82, right? 82 protons. And so when we're looking at comparing this lead-192 to something with a mass of 207, we need to keep the number of protons the same, comparing two different isotopes. So it's a ratio of n over z. So, so Z is staying the same, so this needs more neutrons, right? More neutrons, and the beta decay is a neutron breaking into a proton and an electron. Did I get this right? Yeah. Right? So this is getting rid of a neutron, and this is giving us a neutron. And this is, you know, this, these things that I'm writing down here, these are things that you might want to do on an exam as you're trying to think through this because you can't remember right off the top of your head. I'm not remembering off the top of my head, but it's okay. So a neutron can be thought of as a combination of a proton and an electron. No, that's a zero. Zero, minus one, zero, and one. No, that's no. one and one. Oh my goodness. And one zero. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Get all the numbers to add up, okay? So if we want to get rid of neutrons, we're going to give off an electron. If we want to gain more neutrons, we're going to absorb an electron, I mean a positron. Okay, so what do we need to do here? We need more neutrons, right? So this is going to be what type? Positron or beta decay? Positron. Positron emission. N is the, um, N would be the 192. So if we wanted to actually write an equation here, we could do that. PB, 82, and this is 192. And this is another way to figure it out. If you have positron emission, you're going to have uh, 192 still and 81, right? That's going to be TL. Yeah, it is. It is an L. So this has a z to n, n to z ratio of 192 to 81, and this has a ratio of 192 to 82. So this, this had not enough. The ratio was too low. So by doing this, we increase the ratio, and that's more stable than the first one. Any questions? Right. Yeah, if we did beta emission, it would make the uh, ratio larger. So here's lead to 12. Looking at lead again, so doing 212, this is too high compared to 207. So let's just write it out. Well, does, you know, writing with an eraser doesn't work so good. So doing beta decay, this is going to get us 212 still, but 83. So that is a business. The ratio of neutrons to protons 
is higher in this one than in that one. How about xenon? Xenon 114. The atomic mass on the periodic table is 131. So is this too low or too high? Too low. Too low. To bring it up, we would expect positron emission. So this is, I didn't write it out, but that's beta decay. Okay. Any questions? You got to memorize the symbols for the particles. That's the first thing. Ooh, magic numbers. Doesn't that sound fun? So that ratio is important, but the actual numbers of protons and neutrons also affect the stability. If we look at this table here, um, they're looking at the number of stable nuclides with even and odd numbers of nucleons. So Z is atomic number, number of protons. Even, even, odd, and odd number of neutrons is N. So we can have both of these numbers being even, the protons being even, or the neutrons being even, or both of them being odd. 157 have both of those being equal. These are stable nuclides. Only five stable nuclides have an odd-odd combination. So it appears that it's advantageous for stability if the number of protons and neutrons is even. Turns out nucleons have a tendency to pair together just like electrons do. Not just like, but much like. So electrons paired up, right? We talked about the orbitals and the opposite spins and how they all paired up and that was stable and we did that whole molecular orbital thing with the overlap and the anti-bonding and the bonding stuff. So there's some similar stuff going on with the nucleons. And so even numbers are more stable. The nucleons occupy energy levels. We mentioned this earlier. And just like there are certain elements, elements with certain numbers of electrons are particularly stable. Atoms containing magic numbers of protons or neutrons are also unusually stable. So if the number of protons or the number of electrons, I'm sorry, neutrons, neutrons or protons is 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, or 82, or we have the number of neutrons being 126, these guys are really, really stable. So they are like the noble gases in terms of nucleus stability. And notice that all of these magic numbers are even. So those are what's called magic numbers. I don't think so. I'll, I'll get back to you on that. I don't remember them, uh, but we'll see. Um, radioactive decay series. This graph shows um, the path that uranium-238 takes on its way to becoming a stable isotope of lead-206. So all of the elements with um, with an atomic number above 83 are unstable. They're radioactive. And so they will decay. And this is just showing the decay pattern of, of uranium-238. All the different radioactive nuclides have a decay pattern that they undergo. And some of them run into each other. But this is what uh, uranium does. First, it will go by alpha decay to thorium-234, and then it does two steps of beta decay, and then it does a whole bunch of alpha decays, and then sometimes it does a beta decay here, sometimes it does an alpha, but then it all ends up at the, you know, it's almost like a, a ball falling down. You know one of those marble things with all the little pegs, and it just rattles its way down. It always ends up in the same place. The radioactive decay will continue until you get to a stable nucleus, and then it stops because it's stable. You do not have to memorize this decay series. You just need to know that they exist. Question. Does yes. this process slow down over time? 
as it gets closer to the same stability? Um, that's a good question. We are going to study the kinetics of radioactive decay. And so I don't think you can really, I don't think there's a general trend that it gets slower and slower as you get down here. Um, they're each going to have their own unique uh, rate. What makes it stop? It gets to a stable nucleus. It's done. Then it's done. Yeah. So how do we detect radioactivity? Um, the particles that are emitted in radiation, uh, radioactive emission, are, are high energy. And so we can detect this in terms of its interaction with other atoms or molecules. So uh, one method is a film badge dosimeter. Here's a picture of one. This is a little plastic dealy bobber with a, a pin on the back that you can hook on your lab coat. And it's got a piece of photographic film inside. And the radiation can go through the little plastic case, and it exposes the film inside. And so it's used to monitor the exposure of people who are working with radiation or working near a radioactive source. This does not tell you instantly what the level of radiation is, but it gives you your exposure over time. And so you put that on when you go into work, and when you leave, you take it off. You don't leave it on the bench because then it'll be continually exposed to whatever radiation you're being exposed to. And so they can just keep track of your, um, your exposure that way. So with the Fukushima um, explosion, they were worried about people getting all the radiation from the surrounding nuclear mm -hmm. plant. Yes. And then so they find out with this that they've got radiation exposure, then what happens? So what? Well, with... with the Fukushima nuclear issue, um, they would use real-time detectors before they would let people go in. You would not usually use a, a film badge dosimeter in sort of an emergency situation. This would be like um, a scientist who is working with nuclear um, reactions or um, maybe a medical technician who's, who's in you know, nuclear medicine and using these different nuclear radioactive nuclides. I'm thinking more about the after effects, how they were worried about the farmers in the fields or people in the cities who were exposed. Yeah, they, they could measure it that way. They, they could, yeah. But it measures over time. A Geiger counter, it's technically a Geiger Mueller counter. Um, measures radioactivity in real time. And this is the uh, classic stereotypical radiation detector, is what do you associate with this in radiation? It goes click, 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 right? And the faster it clicks, the more radiation you move away and it slows down. And, and you can actually have it set to give an audible clicking sound. What happens is the, the radioactive, um, I have to keep saying, I keep saying it the wrong way, the particles emitted by radioactive decay pass through an argon-filled chamber, and they create a trail of ionized argon atoms. Because these particles have ionizing power, and they will ionize the argon atoms. Then you apply a high voltage across this chamber, and that causes these ions, which are being produced, to generate an electrical signal. And that can either be displayed on a meter that you can just read, or you can turn it into an audible click, and that clicking sound is what we associate with radiation. You can do both. You can do both. Well, you could do both. So that's how a Geiger counter works. Then there's a scintillation counter. This also measures in real time. Um, here they're using um, some sort of material like sodium iodide or cesium iodide that emits either UV or visible light in response to being excited by these energetic particles. And so this is the same sort of phenomenon as a, um, a flame test, where energy excites electrons, and then when they return to the ground state, they give off a photon of light. So that light can be detected and turned into an electrical signal that also could be read on a meter.